real music. Not that the other music, you know, it's just better. So appreciate that. All right, Colossians chapter 2. Um, last Sunday we looked at verses 13 and 14 here as we've been making our way down through this passage as part of our uh, series of studies now in the book of Colossians. And I want to read the verses that we studied last week and then have a word of prayer and we'll get started. I'm titling this message this morning, it's on Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. I'm titling this, The Triumph of Christ. The Triumph of Christ is what I am calling this. Let's read verse 13 and 14 and have a word of prayer. Verse 13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. Lord, we pray this morning that as we look at verse 15 and we consider the triumph of Christ and how Christ has uh, triumphed and, 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 and what that means for us and how that relates to us as members of the body of Christ, I just pray that we'll have clarity from your word this morning. I pray that we'll be able to rejoice in the truth of the word of God. When everything around us seems to be negative and seems to be just pressing on us, I pray that we'll be able to, to truly set aside some time to think about and to meditate on your word. And we, we're grateful this morning for, our, for the salvation. For the we body of Christ, last Sunday about I just pray that we'll have clarity from your word this morning. I pray that we'll be able to rejoice the the in the Christ truth of the word of God. When everything grace, around us seems to be negative and, and seems to be just pressing on us, I pray that we'll be able to truly set aside some time to think about and to meditate on your word. And we, we're grateful so we're this morning for our today. for the salvation of the body of Christ. I just pray that we'll have clarity from your word this morning. I pray that we'll be able to rejoice in the truth of the word of God. When everything around us seems to be negative and seems to be just pressing on us, I pray that we'll be able to, to truly set aside some time to think about and to meditate on your word. And we, we're grateful this morning for our for the so salvation of the body of Christ. I just pray that we'll have clarity from your word this morning. I pray that we'll be able to rejoice in the truth of the word of God. When everything around us seems to be negative and seems to be just pressing on us, I pray that we'll be able to, to truly set aside some time to think about and to meditate on your word. And we, we're grateful this morning for our... Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Verse 15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So verse 15 is a continuation of verse 14. It's the thought that Paul was developing in verses 13 and 14 continue into verse 15. Okay, so what did we see in the previous verses? What we saw is that as far as believers are concerned, are we totally forgiven? Yes. We also saw, as far as believers are concerned, that the law, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us in verse 14, that the law has been blotted out, i.e., it has been obliterated, it has been expunged. It has been, as the verse says, taken out of what? The way, right? The law that manifests sin that condemned us as sinners has been completely, the righteous requirements of that law have been totally and completely paid off by the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ and it happened at the cross. So, for, so not only is it blotted out and obliterated and expunged and taken out of the way, it is all, it, it's, it, I messed up there, I'm sorry, it's been taken out of the way. So when the Lord Jesus Christ hung on the cross and shed His blood in payment for our sin, he satisfied the righteous requirements of that law. He paid off what that law required on our behalf, and so he has taken it out of the way, right? We went over last Sunday the handwriting of ordinances, how that is a reference to the Mosaic Law. We went, and I, we didn't have time to go there, but I gave you the references that talk about how the law was written with the finger of who? The finger of God. The finger of God is it was involved in that, and how that has been blotted out and how it's been taken out of the way for us, okay? Now we get to verse 15, our main verse for this morning. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, 
triumphing over them in it. So the object, what is the object? The, uh, the Sorry, got ahead of myself. The subject, the main actor of verse 15 is who? The main actor, the subject of verse 15 is the activity of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So when it says in verse 15, He made a show of them openly, in the context, that is referring to whose action? That's referring to the action of Christ. So the subject and the main actor of verse 15 is the Lord Jesus Christ, i.e., He is the one that the statement there, He is the one who hath made a show of them openly. This is talking about something that Christ did, something that Christ accomplished. So the main subject, the main actor of verse 15 is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, The object against whom Christ acted were principalities and powers. So Christ is the subject, he's the main actor. The object that he's acting with respect to are or were principalities and powers. Look at verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them, i.e. principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. So Christ is the subject, he is the main actor, the object uh, uh, that Christ is acting with respect to here are these principalities and powers. Now, we've already seen these beings multiple times already in our study of the book of Colossians. The word translated principality, so if you look at verse 15 there, and it says having spoiled principalities, <coughs> the word translated principalities possesses the meaning of first in time and position, i.e., those rulers who were first in rank and power. That's what he's talking about. That's what it's talking about when it's talking about principalities. Now, it's interesting to consider that anytime Paul talks about principalities and powers, anytime he talks in his epistles about rank and authority, principalities are always mentioned first. It is always principalities and what? And powers. Hold your hand there and come up back to Ephesians chapter 1 quick. Come back to Ephesians chapter 1. And look with me at verse 20. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. We'll start there. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set, his, set him at his own right hand where? In the heavenly places, right? Look at verse 21. Far above all what? Principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Principalities are always mentioned first. When Paul lists out these positions of rank and authority, principalities and powers are always listed first in the list, right? And the reason for that is related to what the word means. These are the rulers who are first in time and position. These are the ones who are first in rank and power and authority. There are principalities and powers. Go over to Ephesians chapter 6. Come over to Ephesians chapter 6. And look with me at verse 12. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we see it again. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness where? So principalities and powers are talking about positions of authority that exist in Paul's mind here in the heavenly what? In the heavenly places, right? He says in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this what? World against spiritual wickedness where? in high places. So Paul is telling us in Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 that Christ, the subject or the main actor, has acted in relationship to principalities and what? And powers. Come back to Colossians chapter 1 now. Come back to Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 16. We've already studied this, but look at verse 16. For by Him, that's talking about Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, here it is, or principalities or what? 
or powers. Every time those two things, principalities and powers, are listed together, principalities are always given first in the list, right? Principalities or powers, all things were created by him and what? So we've already studied Colossians 1.16, right? In heaven and earth are there thrones, dominions, principalities, powers that are created by Jesus Christ that are visible and invisible in heaven and in earth according to verse 16. Okay? Now look at verse 17. And he is before all things. So Christ is before all those things. All those thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, he's before all them. So he made them in verse 16. Obviously, then he would be before all of them in verse 17. And then it says, and by him all things what? Consist or are, 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 are held together, are upheld by Christ. So he made them, he was before them, and they consist by who? By him. All right, now look at verse 18. And he, still talking about Christ, he is the head of the body of the church. Notice the next phrase, who is the beginning? The word in your English Bible there, translated beginning, is the same word that is translated principality. A principality is talking about, let me say it again, it means first in time and position. Right? Now, who created thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers? Christ did. They were created by Him and what? For Him, and He's before all of them, and by Him all of them what? Consist, right? That's what these verses are saying. Verse 18, and He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning. He is the first one. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have what? The preeminence. So He's the beginning, as I've mentioned, the Greek word there is used in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ is explicitly stated there in Colossians 1.18 to be the preeminent one over all what? Over all things. Okay? Well, go to chapter 2, look at verse 10. We also already have seen these principalities and powers. In verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's talking about Christ. Look at verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all what? Principality and power. Well, how can he be the head over all principality and power? Chapter 1, verse 16, 17, 18, and 19 I already explained that to you. Right? So Christ, is, we are complete in Christ. Christ is the head over all principality and power. Now, here's the thing that I want you to think about. When you get to this point, you might have a question along the lines of, well, how could that actually be? How could he actually be the head over all principality and power? I think one of the purposes of verse 15 is to explain that to you. Look at verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So Christ is the subject. He is the actor in verse 15. And the object that he's acting in re with respect to are principalities and powers. Now, let's look at what is the action that he took. If I were you, I would circle or underline a few things in verse 15. Okay, so let's read it slow. And having spoiled. I would circle or underline spoiled. What's the first thing he did with respect to principalities and powers? He spoiled them. Reading on, he spoiled principalities and powers. Second, I would, I would circle or underline, made a show of them. The second thing he did is he made, he, first thing he spoiled them. The second thing he did is he made a what? He made a show of them, right? Read on. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. The third thing he did is he triumphed over them. So he spoiled them, he, he made a show of them openly, and he triumphed over them. There's three things in that verse that the Lord Jesus Christ did with respect to principalities and powers. The first one is that he spoiled them. The second one is that he made a show of them. And the third one is that he triumphed what? Over them. So let's look at the action then that Christ took as it relates to principalities and powers. What did our Lord do to these beings 
And with respect to these evil beings, who we know from Ephesians 6, verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Against principalities, against powers, against spiritual, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, where? In high places, right? We know that right now, largely, the cohorts of the adversary are the ones that are in these positions of authority. Okay? So what did he do? He spoiled them. The first thing he did is that he spoiled them. So if you look up the word spoiled, according to Noah Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language, the word spoiled carries the following meanings. Number one, plundered. So he went into their territory, he went into their domain, he went into their realm of authority, and he plundered, number one. He spoiled, first, F, first meaning of spoiled means plundered, second means pillaged. So did he take them as a spoil? Okay, the word spoil means plundered, pillaged, corrupted, and the last meaning is that he render, it means to render useless. Okay? So did the Lord, so did the Lord Jesus Christ spoil, plunder, pillage, and render useless principalities and powers, according to what that verse is saying? That's, what, that's exactly what that verse is saying. The Lord Jesus Christ has rendered these beings utterly useless, i.e., He has taken them as a spoil of war. He has plundered and pillaged them of their authority, right? That's what it's saying. We already know that from chapter 1, right? Verse 18, chapter 1, verse 18, He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have what? The preeminence, right? So who is the preeminent one in all things? It's Christ, right? Well, now we're learning in chapter 2, verse 15, that Christ spoiled them. He plundered them. He pillaged them. He has rendered them useless, and He has deprived them of their authority. Are you following that? Now think about this. This is what Christ has done according to verse 15, right? Right? What did he warn the Colossians about in verse 8? Go back to verse 8. Beware, lest any man do what? Spoil you. The warning in verse 8 is that the Colossians beware, lest they be plundered, lest they be pillaged, lest they be rendered useless by philosophy and vain deceit, by the tradition of men, by the rudiments of what? The world, right? So think about this. Has, has Christ already spoiled the principalities and powers in heavenly places? Has He already spoiled them, pillaged them, plundered them, and rendered them useless? Has He already done that? But here are now are the Colossians, and are they entertaining this Gnostic philosoph philosophical error that was threatening to spoil them? You see that? So they were being threatened with something that would do to them what Christ had already done to principalities and powers. So if they were going to embrace this Gnostic error in the context, they would be putting Christ beneath. They would be putting Christ lower than these angelic beings that Christ has already what? Spoiled. You following that? Sometimes when we... We got a problem, Mark, with the stream? Oh, I thought you were trying to get my attention there. All right, all right, good. Sometimes we read verse 15, and, we, and, we, and we, we, we come in and we just read verse 15, and we forget that there's a context, right? There's a warning in verse 8 that the Colossians not be what? Spoiled. Why would it be utter uselessness to the Colossians to allow this, this, this philosophy and this tradition of Gnostics, Gnosticism to spoil them. Because they would be, in, doing, in embracing that, they would be taking Christ, who has already spoiled principality and power, and they would be elevating principality and power over who? Over Christ. So Christ has actually, so Christ has actually done in the heavenly realm what the Colossians were in danger of allowing to happen to themselves by listening to this false Gnostic teaching that said Christ was lower than the angels 
angelic beings because he possessed a physical body. This is absolute error and total lunacy on the part of the Colossians to even entertain this idea. Why? Because verse 15, Christ has already spoiled them. He's already pillaged and plundered and rendered them useless. Go back to chapter 2, verse 15. So the first thing Christ did is he spoiled them. That's the first action that Christ took with respect to principalities and powers. The second action that he took with respect to principalities and powers, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them what? Openly. He put them to open shame and humiliated them. The idea here is that by spoiling them, by spoiling them and taking them as a casualty of war, by spoiling them, he openly embarrassed them in front of the entire universe by making a public example of them. He put them to open shame. He made a show of them how? Openly. So he not, you know what they used to do? If an army came through and conquered your kingdom, you know what they would do? They'd march through on a triumphal march with all the slaves and the prisoners and everybody who they've just taken a captive marching in front to show to the people that they just conquered that they were superior, right? Well, what Christ has done in this verse is he has spoiled and plundered principalities and powers, and in doing it, he is now making the universe aware and putting to open shame and embarrassment these angelic beings. So the first thing he did is he spoiled them, and the second thing he's doing is he's putting them to open what? Shame. The idea here is that by spoiling them, he openly embarrassed them. Christ's actions in spoiling them and making them a show, a show of them openly manifest the third thing, and that is Christ's decisive triumph. Read the verse. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. What's the next word? Triumphing over them. So who, Christ, has triumphed over who? Principalities and powers. <coughs> Christ's actions in spoiling them and making a show of them openly manifest his decisive, decisive triumph and victory. The phrase there in verse 15, triumphing over them, as I just mentioned, speaks of, a, speaks of the, triumph, the triumphal procession following a victory over one's enemies. I mean, when the, Romans defeated a, when the Romans defeated an enemy, what did they do? They got all their prisoners, they got all their slaves, they got them together, and then that army marched through that territory that they just conquered and triumphed over as a show of dominion, as a show of strength, as a show of you guys are under our what? Authority. When the Roman legions would return back to Rome, there was a triumphal procession through Rome celebrating the grand victories of the Roman armies over their, over their uh, enemies, right? This is the idea here. The idea here is that. The idea here is not only has he spoiled them, not only has he put them to open shame and embarrassment, but now he's rubbing their face in it. He, is trium he triumphed over them. It's like when, it's not even close to this, but it's similar, you know, to like, Michigan scores a touchdown. I'm, I shouldn't even use this example since we lost this year, and Aaron's probably going to rip me for it. But it's like when Michigan scores a touchdown on Michigan State, and they go to the S in the middle of the field, and they just spike the ball, right? Right on that S, demonstrating, nana, nana, boo, boo, right? We just whooped you. That's the idea here. Christ is putting these guys to open what? Shame, and he is manifesting his what? His triumph over them. The idea of the word triumphing. If you look this word up, Noah Webster's dictionary defines the word triumphing as follows, as follows. Celebrating victory with pomp. Celebrating victory with pomp. Vanquishing, rejoicing for victory. Celebrating victory with pomp. Vanquishing, rejoicing for victory 
insulting on an advantage. Insulting on an advantage. I try to tell my, you know, try to tell my kids, my boys, you know, that if they win, to act like they've won before. Right? Don't act like, you know, this is the first time and you've never, you've never won anything and carry on like a lunatic because you finally what? You finally won, right? But that's not what this is saying. This is saying, not that Christ is a lunatic, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But is Christ just, this is about the triumph of who? Of Christ. This is about celebrating the victory with pomp, vanquishing, rejoicing for victory, insulting with an advantage. He not only spoiled them, he's putting them to open shame, and he triumphed over them in it. Okay? Now, when did this happen? Where did this happen? Read the verse. And having spoiled principalities and powers, Notice that's past tense. Has this already happened? Okay. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show. Has this already happened? Yeah. Triumphing over. Has that already happened? Triumphing over them. What are the last two words? In it. What is the in it referring to? It's referring to verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it where? To the cross. So the in it, where did he spoil them? Where did he put them to open shame? Where did he triumph over them? He did it in and through and at the cross. That's where he did it. That's where he put them to open shame. That's where he manifested to the, to the universe what was going on here, right? Jesus Christ completely, totally, and utterly triumphed over Satan and his principalities and powers at a given point in history, and the given point in history where that happened was at the cross. Okay? The expression in it, in verse 15, harkens back to the cross in verse 14. The grammar, I'm not going to get all technical with you, I'm just going to say it this way. The grammar here indicates that on the cross, okay, at the precise, exact, at that precise and exact moment in time, where? At the cross. At a definitive point in human history, at that exact moment, at that precise time, there was a complete triumph by the Lord Jesus Christ over Satan and his cohort. And it happened there. So, does Sat has Satan been put on notice about his ultimate dominion and authority being stripped from him? He has. And where did it happen? At the cross. Hold your hand here and come over to Matthew 28 quick. In Matthew 28, we see the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection in his post-resurrection ministry to Israel, to the little flock, to the nation of Israel here, we see Christ. We'll look at some Pauline verses here in a minute, but look at what he says here. Matthew chapter 28, look at verse 18. <coughs> Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto who? It's given unto me. Where? Well, why would that be? What has already happened before, Acts, before Matthew 28, verse 18? Christ has already gone to the cross. He's already died on the cross. He's already been buried. He's already been risen again, right? And here He is in His post- resurrection ministry to Israel and the little flock here, he says, listen guys, all power in heaven and earth is given to who? Why? Because he had already spoiled them. He had already made a show of them openly. He had already triumphed over them in it, and the in it is through what? Through the cross. Now, understand, dispensationally, Jesus Christ here in Matthew 8 and in early Acts, etc., in this post-resurrection ministry, 
He's focusing Israel's attention on what this means for that nation as it pertained to that kingdom and him as their Messiah, right? There's nothing spoken about here in, in, in the, in the uh, post-resurrection ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ about what this would mean in the heavenly places or what this meant for the, uh, ange- the angelic beings, the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. But you need to understand, what Paul reveals... What Paul reveals is all that Christ accomplished on that cross. Did Christ accomplish things on that cross that were not made known, that were not manifest, that were not spoken about, that were not revealed in time past to the prophets? But it's still what what Christ was able to accomplish was still bought and paid for when he hung where? So did is that is there information? about what was accomplished at the cross that was a mystery until it was revealed to and through Paul. You following that? So more was accomplished at the cross than what we can read about in the Old Testament and in the Gospel. The revelation of the mystery committed to and through the Apostle Paul reveals, manifests, and declares everything that Christ accomplished at the cross. We learn about the heavenly aspect of Christ's triumph through Paul's epistles. Now go back quickly to Colossians 2. Then I want to look at a couple other things. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, again, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So, folks, the point here in the immediate context of Colossians 2 is why are you Colossians entertaining this dumb idea that Christ is somehow lower than angels? Why are you, look, drop down to verse um, 19, and not holding the head from whom the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered is knit together increase with the increase of God. They were in danger of not holding Christ as the head because they were in danger of embracing this, this, this philosophy of Gnosticism. And Paul's saying in verse 15, he says, what in the world are you guys thinking? Don't you know that Christ has already spoiled these jokers? He's already made a show of them openly, and he's already what? So what they would be doing, in effect, if they were to embrace this Gnostic air, what they would be essentially doing is swapping out the true victor and winner in favor of the losers in favor of the ones that were already spoiled, already pillaged, already plundered, already rendered useless, in favor of those. Why why would they do that? That would not make any sense, would it? And that's what Paul's arguing. But notice, notice that the spoiling, the being made a show of, and the triumphing, All was accomplished by Christ at a definitive point in time, and it happened where? At the cross. Now, did any of these principalities and powers that Christ spoiled, made a show of, and triumphed over, did any of them know about the wisdom of God in a mystery? None of them knew about the wisdom of God in a mystery. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse (coughs) 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world which come to naught. Notice it mentions the princes of this world, verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God. In a what? In a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom. What does it mean that it was hidden wisdom? These dudes didn't know this stuff. It was hidden from them. Hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto who? I heard a grace preacher just last week say something like, we are here by default. That the church, the body of Christ is here by default. What an absolute ridiculous thing to say. We are not here by default. 
we were in the mind of God before the world began. It is an insult to the body of Christ to say that we were here by default, and it's an insult to the plan and eternal purpose of God to say such a thing. Because we were in God's mind before the world began, and He acted in time and history with you in mind, and with me in mind, and with the body of Christ in mind. Didn't we read verses last week about His great love wherewith He was? loved us, you're not here by default, you're here by design that God Almighty before the world began decided that He would open up a time frame called the dispensation of grace where He would save every man, woman, and child that would trust in His Son. And not only would He save you, He would forgive you of all your sin and make you a joint heir with Him. You're not here by default. Get a little upset about that, in case you couldn't tell. Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world under our glory, here it is, which none of the princes of this world, what? Knew, for had they known it, they wouldn't have what? Now, they w so if they had known this information, what would they not have done? They would not have crucified the Lord of glory, right? Now put that verse together with Colossians 2, verse 15. Where did Christ spoil them? Where did He put them to open shame? And where did He triumph over them? He did it through the what? Through the cross. They might not have known it at the cross because had they known it, they wouldn't have what? But through the revelation of the mystery committed to and through the Apostle Paul, they look at that cross, the thing that they thought would secure their victory is the very thing that brings about their ultimate shame and demise. Are you following that? Go to, go to first, go to... Go to, go, go to um, uh, Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. People ask me the question from time to time. <coughs> they say, why don't more people understand this message? this grace message, this distinctive message and ministry of the Apostle Paul. You want to know why the answer is? It has an enemy that hates this truth. Why? Because this truth manifests and demonstrates across the heavenly places that these guys didn't know what they thought they knew. And it puts them to open what? Shame. It puts them to open shame. Ephesians chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 9. <clears throat> Paul says here, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Is it God's will that the whole body of Christ know this truth? Is it in the Bible? It's right there, Ephesians 3, just read it. Who will have all men, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Here's the question then, if that's his will, if he wants all men to see the fellowship of the mystery, then why don't all men see it? It's not because he hasn't made it known. It's not because he hasn't revealed it. It's not because it's not available to them. It's because the adversary hates this truth and is actively trying to conceal this truth from the body of Christ. By, getting, by, by simply 
getting them to not rightly divide the word of truth and to go around thinking they are spiritual Israel. And by doing that, can he take a member of the body of Christ who is designed to be a trophy of God's grace for this dispensation and take that member of the body of Christ and, and, and make that person guilty of identity theft and stealing Israel's identity and trying to take it for him or herself. And by doing that, what does he effectively accomplish? He keeps the lid on this truth. You following that? And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. We are not here by default. We are here because God wanted us to be here and planned for us to what? Be here. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by who? Jesus Christ. To the intent that now, here it is, that now unto who? Wait a minute. Unto who? Okay, so... Who didn't know about the wisdom of God and the mystery, and had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory? Where were principalities and powers spoiled, made open, uh, put on open display, made an open uh, show of, and triumphed over? At the cross. To the intent that now one of the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church. Who's that? That's us. Might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of who? This is why Satan hates the mystery, folks. This is why this truth is in the Word of God, but yet so often ignored, is because Satan has doctrines of devils and winds of doctrine that he has howling through the body of Christ to move you to anywhere he can other than to take a stand for this thing here. And even if you take a stand for this thing here, don't think he won't come after you and try to get you into some goofiness. This is why Satan hates the mystery, folks. This is why more churches do not believe and teach the wisdom of God in a mystery. It's not because God hasn't made it known. It's not because it's not in the Scripture. It's not because God hasn't preserved His Word. It's because the adversary is actively trying to keep a lid on this because it is an absolute embarrassment to him. Go read Ezekiel 28 where, where it says that no secret can be hid from him. Go read these verses, right? Come with me over to First. Uh, come with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm almost done. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What does God do? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 3, 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written. What? He taketh the wise in their own what? Hold your hand here and come back to Ezekiel 28. There's a lot to talk about here, so I'll just cover a few things quick. This passage is a, I believe this passage is a description of Lucifer before he what? Before he fell. Verse 12, Son of man, take a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. When he's talking about the king of Tyrus, he's talking about the person behind who? The king of Tyrus. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Who is in Eden? God was in Eden. Adam was in Eden. Eve was in Eden. And who else was in Eden? Serpent. Right? And then it talks about how he's covered with the precious stones the burl, the onyx, the jasper, etc., right? How he has the, the built-in pipes and orchestration, right? And that he was, that, that he was perfect in, in uh, uh, which were prepared thee from the day that was created. Thou art the anointed, what? Cherub. This passage is describing Lucifer before he, what? 
It talks down here about him being lifted up in pride and how he was perfect in all his ways till iniquity was found in him, right? Now, in the context, go back with me and look at verse 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. Thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than what? Daniel, there is no secret that can be what? Folks, the orig- you need to hear what I'm going to say. The original contest between God and Satan, between God and Lucifer, was not who was more powerful. Lucifer knew and understood that he was a created what? Being. That he was a contingent being and that his existence was contingent upon his creator. He knew and understood that, right? The contest between God and Satan was not over power, was not over beauty, was not over any of that stuff. You know what it was over? It was over wisdom. And Lucifer says, there's no secret that you can what? What does God Almighty say? We'll just see about that, buster. He taketh the wise in their own what? Craftiness. He, through the cross, and the revelation of the mystery of all that was accomplished at the cross, has taken these guys, these beings, he's spoiled them, he's plundered them, he's pillaged them, he's rendered them useless. He's put, you know know the story of the Scarlet Letter? Right? He's manifest and declared across the universe. He's put them to open what? Shame. And in doing it, all of that to manifest the fact that he triumphed over them. One last verse, coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Folks, this is why, this, this is the answer to the question of why more people don't see this and understand this. It's not because we're so smart. Okay? It's not. It's not because, you know, we're uber spiritual or anything like that. The only difference is that we've read some verses and understood some verses that are in the Bible. Can anybody that has a Bible read and understand this stuff? But you know what it takes? It takes some study. That's what it takes. There's nothing... I mean... Honestly, all, all, of, all of us that are here who, have, who, who understand this, you know, I was fortunate to have grown up with this. Not everybody in here can say that, right? But for those of you that didn't grow up with it, there was a point in time where you saw some things in the Scripture and you're like, and the light bulb started to what? Woo! woo, woo. I mean, they're going off, right? And you're like, whoa, why didn't I ever see that before? And then you're like, well, I want to know some more about that. And as you search for the truth, you found things that differ. You found the Grace Life Bible Church website. You found folks that were out there who believed and saw this stuff and were able to help you understand it. Right? So if if he's triumphed over them through the cross, if he spoiled them, if he put them to open shame and all that, and it all relates to the revelation of the mystery, look at this verse right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the what? Does he want the cross preached? Does the adversary want the cross work of Christ clearly preached? No. Why not? Because it is his utter total embarrassment for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of what folks it's the power of God not only for our salvation and our justification and our forgiveness of sins but it is the power of God to deprive 
the adversary and all his homies up there, of all their power and all their authority, and it was done through the cross. He does not like the cross being preached. Because the preaching of the cross, number one, takes a lost man and saves them from their sin. But if the totality of the cross is preached, if everything that Christ accomplished at the cross is preached, you know what it does? It removes the blinders of religious confusion. And it helps you to understand that when Paul says things like, through Christ we have the victory, we really do. We really do. So I would just encourage you folks to just, man, think about that stuff. Don't, th look, this stuff will edify you. This stuff will build you up. Worrying about the Supreme Court and Texas and secession from the United States and all this stuff, that's not going to build you up. It's going to stress you out, worry you, and you'll go down the wormhole of politics, and before you know it, it's been six months before you even cracked this book. Okay? Let's make the issue... By the way... And if coronavirus really is so bad, then shouldn't, then, and there are people dying, what should we be doing? Preaching the word. Not worrying about what the nut bar politicians are doing. Because you have no control over that. But you have control over the message that will save somebody's soul from hell and the message that will build them up in the faith. That should be our priority. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. <clears throat> We're grateful for the triumph that we have in Christ. We pray that we will focus on what's good, what's right, what's just, what's true, what's lovely, what's of good report. And we'll allow those things to be the sentinels and the guardians of our mind. What a victory that was won at the cross. What a total and utter rout of an enemy. And the enemy didn't even know how bad he was routed until you revealed the mystery to Paul. And what an embarrassment it would be for the very thing that you bragged about for thousands of years from eternity past since you were created to be the very thing that ends up being your undoing. What an embarrassment. What a humiliation. Help us to understand why people fight this truth. Why more people don't understand and want to see this truth. Help us to understand that it is a spiritual issue. That we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. That it's not that person. It's not that physical person that doesn't want to see it. That doesn't want to trust Christ. That doesn't want to believe the gospel. That doesn't want to give up their religious tradition. That doesn't want to... It, it, it's, it's not them. It's the winds of doctrine. It's the doctrines of devils. It's the thing the adversary has put there to confuse them, to ensnare them, to entrap them to beguile them, to spoil them. We pray that we will not get stuffed, shirted, and high and mighty and think we're something else because we understand this. Because we are, in fact, nothing without you. But help us to be ambassadors of this truth. 